So in our last set of videos, we talked about how the capitalist in a society that is capitalistic must inevitably exploit and alienate the worker, the laborer, the proletariat, and how this must inevitably lead to a class conflict. Now what we want to do today in these videos is explain what Marx believes is the inevitable scientific and historical process that leads to this. And he believes that these are not the products of conscious human choices or ideas, but instead the inevitable result of what he calls a historical and materialist process. He calls this historical materialism or dialectical materialism. And what we want to do in this particular video is explain the general contours of this particular philosophy of history. So let me read to you how he describes it because it really is summed up in a nutshell from his particular preface to a book he wrote which he calls A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy. And this is how he puts it. The general conclusion at which I arrived and which once reached became the guiding principle of all my studies can be summarized as follows. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations, which are independent of their will, namely relations of production, appropriate to a given stage in the development of the material forces of production. The totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. The real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. I'm going to repeat that because that's the crucial difference between his philosophy of history and someone like Hegel's. Okay? It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. At a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production. Material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production. And thus, a revolution will occur. So that's his philosophy of history in a nutshell. As I said, it has two major characteristics. It's a historical dialectical process, and it is a materialist process. So what makes it historical is this, is that human history itself is characterized by a sort of development that's inevitable. And this development will always lead to two poles in human history, two types or groups of people that will then inevitably fight it out. And that fight will produce a new equilibrium in history, which will then produce a new social structure, a new set of classes, and these new sets of classes will become in con conflict with each other inevitably, and thus history is pushed on by this cycle of conflict between different types of humans. Why is it materialist? Well, it's materialist because the driving forces are not what we would think. Normally we think humans have a certain view of the world, they have certain ideas of how things go. Those ideas influence how they act in the world and thus influence the world itself. And thus you would think ideas create action which then create history. Marx says no, it's the exact opposite. Indeed, humans at their most basic level act without thinking. 
they act like any other animal in the desire to fulfill their wants and needs. And thus it is physical activity, the active striving for the fulfillment of wants, that creates this, you might say, activity, labor. And that causes what he calls productive forces. Because humans, in acting to fulfill their needs, seek to influence nature. Thus, they seek to shape it, and shape it through production. We'll call that PF from now on, productive forces. These productive forces consist of two basic elements. Labor, human labor, and the tools that humans create in order to fulfill their labor, to allow their labor to be successful. So thus we have human labor and the means of labor, or the means of production, which will be technology at a certain stage. So you might say, thus humans create a productive force that then influences how they live. Well, these productive forces then cause what he calls the relations of production. They create society, social relations. So what do we mean? Well, let's take the most primitive stage for him, the Neolithic stage, the stage of the hunter and gatherer. Those stages are going to be societies, but their societies are going to be the most basic unit possible, just families and clans that are together by the fact of common birth. And they're all obviously trying to survive and get food and shelter, and the way they do this is through hunting and gathering. That kind of society will not have any surplus. Everyone just gets enough to live on. And obviously hunting, if I'm going to hunt, for example, a woolly mammoth, I can't do it by myself. I need partners. And so everyone is going to be working together, but they're all going to be, you might say, on an equal status. Nobody has more than anybody else. No one is stronger, really. You have a bunch of people coming together, cooperating in what he calls a primitive communist society. And as a result, the productive forces are just simply the tools of labor, which will be hunting tools and basic tools to create shelter, and the humans doing those things. And the relations of production will then simply be partnerships. They will be equal. There won't be any sort of hierarchy because no one has enough to dominate anybody else. And so, therefore, these relations are going to be equal not only with each other, but at a very low level with regard to nature, because not a lot of manipulation in nature is going on. And so, as a result, there's going to be close relationship with each other and nature. And thus, social divisions are going to be simply divisions of labor. There aren't going to be anything else. Well, that kind of social relation, what does it do? Well, it strengthens the productive forces. It allows it to perpetuate and to keep going. And so these kinds of social relationships are just what you need to keep these productive forces going. Well, then what happens? Well, if you look at cave paintings, you see primitive religion occurring, don't you? And you see that what is worshipped is the animal, the totem, the spirit animal, nature itself. Well, that makes sense because what you want is everyone to be motivated to take seriously the equality of everything in nature and how you are totally dependent on nature. And so an ideology, a conscious ideology arises, not before the fact, but after the fact. And it fits the economic system, doesn't it, and the social relations, and strengthens it and serves to justify why we live like this but it comes after the fact. Now, of course, it influences. Once this ideology occurs, it strengthens the relations of productions, the social conventions that have been set up. It strengthens the worship of the animals. It strengthens the way in which the society lives and migrates and why it only kills a certain number of animals at a certain time, why it worships this and values this. But all of them are there precisely because of the unconscious productive forces that are already there. So then what happens? Well, you might say that as these productive forces improve, 
these will eventually outgrow the relations of production that originally solidified them. And that's when social change will occur. The outgrowth will occur in two ways. Either technology will improve so that new types of production occur, and therefore new types of people are needed, and this comes in conflict with the existing relations of production, which then make these existing relations, you might say, fetters rather than helps, chains instead of crutches to help continue the process of human productive activity. Or it might be, as we said, these classes that come into play start to conflict with each other so that one needs to strive for dominance over the other and eventually a dominance is won. But here's the general pattern, he says. Once we come out of this Neolithic stage of primitive communism, once technology improves that human labor then produces surplus, then we're going to have a domination of what we would call the haves versus the have-nots. The oppressors or those who dominate the system versus those who are the oppressed and are used to perpetuate the system. This then develops into a conflict that eventually the have-nots will win. And when they win, they become the new haves and they dominate society, create a new class consciousness, a new ideology that justifies their system, a new set of social relations that keep it in place, and thus producing a new set of habits or have-nots, and thus a new set of conflicts, a new evolution to revolution, and so forth. So, historical dialectical materialism is the thesis that our history determines our ideas, and our ideas then solidify what we already do. We are not the products of our choices, but we are the products of our products, and our products the products of unconscious, creative, historical, physical activities that push us on to the road he thinks that will inevitably lead to a class of society called communism.